part one on one with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Welcome to Art One on One. I'm your pod boss, Nicole Jordan, alongside America's favorite art teacher, professional artist, and master educator, Mr. Berger. Hello. That was a mouthful. That's a lot to say, and I appreciate I appreciate the, the kind introduction today. We have a lot of things to cover. There's a lot of content going in today's episode. We've taken uh well, there was a little bit, a little bit of a gap. We've been traveling the world and seeing things. Are you tired? I am. It's been a long day. We just so, got back not long ago from vacation, and and so we're kind of in the in the crux of getting back into the swing of real life. So anyway, uh, that's what spring break will do to you. It's here and it's gone. Right. So, uh, where would you like to start, oh, mighty? Oh, actually, you know what? Is it okay if I start this time? You go for it. Okay. So, in a previous episode, we had talked about um, masculine and feminine traits. Mm -hmm. You remember this? So, there was a... Um, Masculine and feminine traits. Right. We talked about how uh, people should, like when we raise, we talked about uh, raising boys and girls the right. same. Mm -hmm. We talked, and you had brought up that that having masculine and feminine traits was valuable. Right. And Balance this has masculine and this has gotten over six thousand views. This this little clip of that conversation, it's had over a dozen comments. Uh. All over, from all over the place, um, that are questioning and having commentary on this discussion that we've had. Okay. Um, one of them was from Jessica BF Eight SS, who writes, "It's okay to acknowledge that men and women are different. Anyone with a son and daughter can tell you that." And I don't think. That what we're saying is that boys and girls are the same. I think what we're saying, at least what I'm saying, is I don't, I'm not going to speak for you. What I was saying is I think it's important to raise boys and girls the same way in terms of, um, like consistency well, as far yeah, as how right, you raise them. Right, like like you know, if I'm going to go take the kids to a baseball game. Mm -hmm. The boys are going to the baseball game. The girls are going to the baseball game. They're all going to the baseball game. If we're going to a football game, the boys are going to the football game. The girls are going to the football game. If we're going to whatever, whatever it might be that like we're doing as a family, whether you, it's a you vacation. Don't think you're, you don't think you'll raise your daughter or you have raised your daughter different than your son at all. In the way that you, like, when you expected them to be home and, like, the rules and, like, things like that. You don't think... I think if no. I have all boys, so I don't know the answer to this, but I think if I had girls and boys, I bet I would... I, I think I would... I think I would raise them differently. I don't know. Well, you're... you're but, again, you're, you're, you're very much singing a little different tune... Here's the thing, though. ...than you did. Okay, but here's where I was going to expand on that. Like... Okay. Even more so to me, it's like, I don't, boy, girl, whatever, it's like every kid is different. Like, you notice in my three kids, every kid is different. They like different things. They communicate different ways. They enjoy, I mean, their their character is drastically different from one to the next. And it's crazy because they've all been raised in the same way. But I think the bit for me, big picture Boy, girl doesn't matter to me. It's like, I'm going to look at each kid individually, and I may discipline one different than the other. I may communicate one with one differently than the other based on who that kid is, like internally, like emotionally, physically, all of those things. Well, it kind of goes into a, what an, another comment that was brought up. This is by Stephanie Husted 2585 who writes 
that's why there's a mother and a father raising a child, raising all the same, no, impossible. Children are not all the same. And to that degree, I agree. You, you, but I, 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 the thing is, like, my, my, my oldest son and daughter had the same kind of curfew. This is when you're home. This is the expectation. This is the punishment if you break that rule. My son doesn't get an excuse to run around with his buddies because he's a boy. And my daughter doesn't get to go run around with her friends because she's a girl. They have the same rule and the same expectation. No, none more strict or lenient than the other. But I will say, raising children all the same based upon that individual is impossible like you were just saying as well, because it's one of those things where, um, you know, one of my sons is into football, is into sports, athletics. So I buy him sports things, athletic things, things that are, I do things with him that are more sports oriented. I have another son that's more into arts and coloring. So I buy him artsy things because that's what the individual kid is into. Not because, well, they're the, they have they're both Boy boys. And... They're got to be the same. Yeah, you know, I don't have an expectation of one or the other. This is where the, their interests lie. So that's where we're gonna go. Um, so I think. What that, are, yes. Okay. So what are the other comments? This is there, this there was is very interesting. To there me. was one other comment that I had written down that I thought was very pointed. This is from Rabbi Rabbi Roy Rena who writes, males and females, this is going to maybe be, um, uh, yeah. Controvers uh, controversial? It's, uh, yeah, a little challenging, I suppose. Males and females are different, which, again, that particular isn't terribly hard to swallow. Yeah, I agree with that. There isn't a need to teach women masculine behavior or males feminine behavior. Boys are to be raised masculine to grow into men in order to protect and provide for women. Girls need to be oh. raised. <laughs> yeah, this is girls. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Girls need to be raised feminine <laughs> to grow into women in order to support men and the children. <laughs> That's how it's been since the dawn of time. Are we no, still living in the 1900s? No need to change it. And ruin our youth. Interesting. And let's I, let's hear your response to that first. And here here's the thing is like before, I'm gonna like preface and say what I say is just my belief and nothing more. Right. But this is something that is very like close to my heart as far as how we treat men, women, boys, girls, and I don't know how you want your kids to be raised so okay you go you go first my, uh, my initial thought is on the on the initial comment of uh, males and females are different males and females are different going back to our previous comment every individual kid is different regardless of whether and they're male or it's just like when we're off on spring break my daughter is in there. She's wanting to fish with your son. I'm not a fisherman. You, <laughs> we've established we this. <laughs> and it, my dad, my dad was a fisherman. My oldest son is a fisherman. They love out. They both of my uh, these fellas are are into the outdoorsy thing. I'd rather stay home in color. Uh, if I, if, I mean, I, I don't mind going for a walk in the woods or doing things outdoors or outdoorsy sorts of things or camping or whatnot, but, um, th not the point. The point is that, that my youngest daughter wanted to be in there with your youngest son and they wanted to go out and fish and they do the thing and touch the fish and, you know, put the bait on the hook and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I don't think that there should be a distinction. That, well, girls can't fish or boys can't cook or, you know, like, mm -hmm. that's woman's work or that's man's work. You know, that's that's crazy, in my view. 
again, my views are just my views. Uh, I think that that there are domestic things that boys need to know how to do. That I think there are domestic things that girls need to know how to do. And when you get into a household, if you have one of those people that says, you know what, I don't know how to do the laundry. Well, what the hell, you, what, what have you been doing? Yeah. I don't know how to do the dishes. I don't know how to go. I don't, I don't know how to change my tire I, from my perspective. Basic. I don't know how to fix something in my car. I don't know right. how to change the oil. I don't know. Right. Well, but there again, again, we've had this sort of conversation where one of your sons had a tire issue. He didn't know how to change the tire. So me being the son of a, a shop teacher, all right, I'm going to teach you how to change your tire. We jack it up. I show him how to do it. I show him how to take the lug nuts off and get the tire off and put the, the new tire on and bing, bang, boom. You know, we're, we're, we're traveling, right? And it's a very simple thing. Uh, it's just taking the time to teach them those things. But I, I don't think that learning how to change a tire is masculine or feminine. I think it, it's just according to history. It is. I mean, uh, I, I, I mean, historically, that would be the male thing to do, and like the male is the go-go, do-do, the worker, the bring brings home the the uh, supports for the family, provides right. for the family, and the female stays at home, watches the kids, doesn't go to work. But I'm sorry, that is not today's world. Well, and I think that <laughs> in anybody that's out there doing it knows that if you're a single parent you're doing it all you're 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 fighting an uphill battle and you're probably losing just because there's so much stuff to do there's only so much time in the day you got to make this you got to do that you got to get the appointment you got to take them there and you got to go to work and you got to do all the things right. and it's impossible to do all of those things and one of the one of the writers. It's absolutely true that, that there's a there's a mother and there's a father. And that is, I mean, that's and, that's obviously, I mean, psychologically, like if you talk to someone in therapy, that's the best case scenario: having a mother and a father. But also, it's it's even more important that they are supportive and loving and caring. And and so, if you have two a mother and a father that are none of those things, right. It, it's better to have a single parent that does all of those things. But again, going back to the original, my original brain point, that yes, having a mother and father are 100% valuable. And because I'm a masculine male and you're a feminine female, well, we bring certain things to the table that are different. Just maybe, I don't know if that's necessarily dictated by gender or what that is. I don't understand, I don't know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, if, if your boys wanted to go out and shoot hoops, they don't want to go with me because it's going to be embarrassing for me. If they want to go out and play basketball, they need to go with you because you'll actually be able to compete with them. Now, there are things that, you know, if they want to learn how to make, uh, cook something up in the kitchen, I'd be more, I mean, I, I'm not horrible in the kitchen. And not to say, not to demean you or anything else, but I'm, I mean, you're not a bad cook, but I, <laughs> but, but I'm not, nice but I'm not, a, I, I don't feel like I'm a bad cook either, you know, uh, so I mean, it's one well, of the. Well, and honest to goodness, I, I, there, I want you to share the cooking. I don't want to come home and do the cooking or the food every night. I want there to be a balance there, and. And so that idea of well, the kitchen is the woman's place, and the the garage is the man's place. I, mm, is it though? I mean, I know, I know lots of folks that that would very much argue with that, and I think that. There's not necessarily, like, we're, we attach gender to things that don't necessarily need a gender attached. There's not a gender on fixing a tire. There's not a gender on putting in a new toilet. There's not a gender on, you know, 
yeah. making a painting or a sculpture. There's not a gender on a lot of things that we want to assign gender to. And um, at the end of the day, you want your kids to be mentally well and strong and, and healthy kind. and kind and decent and empathetic and all of those things. I think that those things are very valuable. And I think that there's a lot of kids that don't have those, whether you're talking about boys or girls. You know, there's a lot of kids that don't have that. And th the point is that um, I want to give my kids the opportunities that they need. And it's not, there, there's a lot of things that, you know, I don't feel like I necessarily need to raise my daughter to be a little princess. And I don't need to raise my son to, to feel like he's Mr. Macho Man. Uh, I just don't feel like either one of those is healthy. Well, and I, I agree. I mean, I want my kids to be able to cook, clean, change a tire, help someone that's in need, whatever it is. It's And that, to me, is a balance of the masculine and feminine. And I like I, it's nothing deeper than that for me. It's just like it used to be this way and, you know, where the women stayed at home and the women took care of the children and did all those things and the males were the exactly like he said the providers and you know did the jobs and and I don't think that's true anymore and I want them to be prepared for the world upcoming and whether whether I think that's right or wrong the way the world has evolved it is what it is so we either um be resilient and adapt and change and prepare them in the best way that we can or you know you get left behind and well it's it's quite frankly not the 1950s anymore right and we have to move our mindset beyond but again that. if that's but, works for that person and that well, is that's it then that's awesome if it's a positive healthy situation and both people that are in that situation feel like that then right who I love it. Great. Who are we to exactly? Right. But that's just not how. But uh, and again, I just I thought that that was an interesting discussion that we had had. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of buzz behind it uh, on that particular little uh, short video that I had put out there, and so I wanted to just kind of draw some attention back into it. And uh, when did you drop that video? I don't. I don't. I didn't write that down. It's been it's been a little while. It's been out there for a couple weeks, probably a couple two two three weeks, maybe. It's a hot topic right now, especially in my industry, about because the world has been such a masculine driven place and right. held and supported and protected by men, and now things are kind of shifting and yeah. shaking things up. Which well, I don't and know, I think it's a good thing. Oh. Uh, I, I think that a lot of times people want to say feminism is a bad word, but I'll be honest, like, I'm I'm a little bit of a feminist. I'm a little bit of a, you know, I believe that women should be equal to men, not better, not worse, equal. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that we do things the same or think about things the same, but we need to have equal representation and equal, equal opportunity. You know, there was an interesting... Not, and not to dwell on it, because we've talked about it a lot here, but one last little side note on it is uh, there was a, an interview with Tina Fey. Tina Fey is one of the Saturday, Saturday Night Live character people, but she was a writer on Saturday Night Live. And when they first got her on the show as a writer, it was kind of like a, a lot of men. And then all of a sudden they started writing different um, comic things that were more of the feminine perspective, more of the female perspective. Like, we think that's funny. And they were like great comic things that she was coming up with, Amy Poehler was coming up with. They were doing these things together and wow, it, like, it really worked. Well, had a female not been in that position as a writer, well, those things had, would never get written because it was always from the male writing perspective because as a guy, you're going to write from your perspective and as a girl, you're going to write from your perspective and having both perspectives at the table makes it work. Just like what we're talking about with, you know, 
the art table at the art museum, right. having having white, white guys and black guys and Asian guys and and white females and black females and Asian females and 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 and, and having. Um, other groups and other subgroups and other forms of of perspective, other perspectives coming into the table really makes it work. And without all of those things involved, um, it, it's it's a very narrow perspective. Right. And uh, so anyway, we can move on from there. Uh, where would you like to go? Well, uh, that can kind of take us right into Ask the Art Guides because Ask the, art guides. the card I drew uh, is very um, on topic here. Grayson Perry is the artist that I drew. And from what I know of him, he is a very like eccentric, uh, what do I want to say, um, flamboyant male that has a very feminist side to him and he talks about it in some of his videos and that but um so grayson <laughs> it's interesting we're on that topic. grayson perry is not someone that i'm that i've ever come across is is this more of like a performance art artist he, or i mean no he's a well he's a contemporary artist but he did a little bit of everything what it looks like mm. um i mean he did some photography he did some sculpture he did some painting like i I I don't know would be the okay. the answer, but he talks about like having a ma very masculine hard upbringing and how it's affected him and um, and he's very feminine. Like when you see in, see him in his art shows, a lot of times he's dressing up in, in the videos that I watched as a female um, mm. person. So it's interesting that we are on this topic because there you know there's that from one extreme to the other you have. Right. You know. Well, and, and you know, there are, you know, th there are so many ways to label people. I don't want to get into a labeling thing, whether he's transgender or whether he's a cross-dresser or whether, regardless of, I mean, obviously he's using him, his type pronouns, so transgender would probably not apply, I, I would assume. Um, but, but again, I don't know th uh, the artist um, I think it's interesting because I do think that's like just another form of art for him is how he dresses up as these female. It's I the mean, persona. What was one? Yeah. Like a, like a cross dresser or, or maybe just, you know, just that's a fun. part of his character. Yeah, exactly. And, and some of the, and, and which again, I think a lot of times people get really, really worked up about things that at the end of the day, does it matter what clothes I wear? I mean, if that's where I'm comfortable, then. Who if gives, I'm a good person, what does it matter? Who gives a crap what clothes if I wear? If I love people, treat them with respect, I mean, have make compassion. Make fun of my sweatshirt, make fun of my hat, make fun of my glasses, but why? Yeah. Like, at the end of the day, I mean, why? Yeah. You know? So, I, I like I like to wear Skechers. Can I have my car back? <laughs> so, you do kind of have old man shoes. And I'm okay with it. <laughs> All right, so which one of the three uh, items... Uh, do we want to use to drive the conversation? The life, the work, or the inspiration? I'm going to use the work because I would like some information or I would like you to explain something to me. Okay. The, the work says meaning separates art from craft. Okay. And to be completely honest with you, I have no idea what the difference is between art and craft and what this is actually saying. Meaning separates the difference between art and craft. Well, it just says meaning separates art from craft. Well. So what is your definition of art and what is your definition of craft? Okay. So uh, as a, uh, as an art instructor, here's what I would tell you about the difference between art and craft. In art, you would have the autonomy to create based upon your own ideas and your own vision craft you're given an example and you're trying to replicate that thing over and over again so for example you go on to print to pinterest right and they and it shows like the little cupcake you know like decorate your cupcake to look like a cookie monster okay that is a craft you're trying to make this look like that 
okay, boys and girls, we're going to make this project. We're going to take the, you know, elementary school stuff. You're going to take the pipe cleaners and the little tongue depressor stick and the, the, the paper, and you're going to color, you're going to color, you know, this red, you're going to color this blue, and you're going to color this green, and you're going to glue the sticks, okay. and at the end of the thing, your project is going to look just like everybody else's. So yours, and yours, and yours, and yours, and mine all look the same. And I got into it with one of my daughter's teachers. I think it was, she might have, she was in early elementary, kin, now when, maybe kindergarten, first grade, and she was concerned that my oldest daughter uh, was coloring outside the lines too much. And my thought was, who the hell cares? As an art teacher, who the hell cares if she's coloring outside the lines? Well, I think I would if that, that was the, no. if that was the instructions. No. To color I think, in the lines? I think that, that I mean, I understand the idea, like they wa they're wanting to, to develop... Uh, certain motor skills and things like that, but at the end of the day, that's pretty small potatoes in first and kindergarten. Second, does she know how to read? Is she doing math? It, can she comprehend what she's reading? Can she understand the mathematical Did formula? Did she have her glasses at that time? Yeah, she's had her glasses since she was little, really little. Um, but all of those things are are really, really, really um, much, much more important at that age than the fine motor skill of coloring inside the lines. Yeah, I get what you Now, saying. with elementary kids, craft is a lot easier because it's, okay, boys and girls, we're trying to learn how the color wheel works. And so we're going to mix this blue paint with this yellow paint and see what happens. Oh my gosh, we got green. Okay, it's a little crafty, but it's the, okay. But then, what do you do with it? That's where it's. That's, that's where art. that's where it becomes art. So, what does this mean? So, meaning separates art from craft. I don't understand. I think what that saying. I think what I think what this means. How I interpret it, and you've said that this is a lot of interpretation. It is. That the message behind the art, the message behind the craft, is what separates them. Where the art, in my view, the art meaning is a little bit more like I have to develop it. Where the craft meaning is we're all kind of conforming to a singular standard. Doing step by step by step to get to this point is, I mean, that's just part of, that's part of everything. Being able to follow directions and, and, it's and like, recreate it's, and, it's, yeah, I mean. It's like the you got to follow a rubric, right? Right. So if you're mastery, you're here. If you're proficient, you're here. If you're doing okay, you're here. If you're struggling, you're here. And where are you on the spectrum of getting the concept and a lot of craft is you, you can really you can see instantly okay they glued the sticks they did this they colored this they did that they didn't do this they didn't do that it's easy to assess that rubric where in true art it's okay we're going to it's more of a broad concept and they bring those tools together so it's a little more advanced so as you get to the middle school high school levels that's where you're going to find the true art coming in whereas the elementary levels it's we're doing a lot of crafty type things so you learn the basics of how to make art when you get the reins released i feel like there's still a lot of creativity involved in crafting if you're changing and evolving and making it your own there can be piece like my, well the thing like my mom my mom used to love to do uh, cross stitch she'd have like a little like a mat type like a little like a fabric thing and she would have her colored yarn string and she'd take have her needle and do the yeah. do the whole cross stitch thing she wasn't developing her own pattern. She wasn't developing her own thing. 
it's a craft. She was following a book that told her, here's where this color goes, here's where that color goes, here's, and she's just following the, following the recipe. Making, uh, making cookies in the kitchen is a whole lot of, I mean, it's a craft. But okay. if you decide, I'm going to take two or three recipes and put them together and try to make the ultimate cookie recipe. It's still crafting. It, but it's art. I, see, you're because, losing me there. Okay, because... so, so if, I, if I just take the recipe, follow, follow, follow the recipe, that's craft. You're still starting with three. If you're just like, okay, I'm going to take these ingredients and do put make this recipe, which you do a lot, I cannot do. That would be art to me, but not starting with three different recipes. To me, that's still crafting. Well, I, but you're taking three different things and you're combining and you're taking, okay, this recipe says use this much butter and this recipe says use this much flour and this recipe says use this much whatever. And okay, well, I, I'm going to take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and I like the butter in this and I like this and I'm going to use this ingredient instead of that ingredient. And fuse it together, and that to me is crafting. But it's not, in my view, that's art. Well, and so we can post this up as a shorty, <laughs> and the, the public will tell you you're wrong. <laughs> I Once think there's going to be a lot of mixed. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of mixed feelings on that one too. All right. So as we completely shift gears into the journey into journey the archives. The archives what is the video that you viewed this week? It was called Guernica. Guernica. From five years ago. Five years old. Uh, so I was doing a Picasso one. And I think I did this shortly thereafter, I, after doing Picasso, uh, the, the uh, Picasso video. Anyway, the Guernica one, I mean, there was, a, I did a lot of research on the background story and the uh, World War II and mm -hmm. all of the major players and how this city in Spain got uh, decimated. In a matter of four hours. I, I mean, it was just crazy. A, four, a quarter of the, the people died. That day, not saying yeah. what happened after that, which... Right. Um, yeah, it was hard to listen to the video. You know how I hate... <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually I surprised. So. Maybe you didn't know what you were getting into. I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> when you watched that one. <laughs> because I couldn't, I wouldn't think that you, knowing you, and I know you a little bit, knowing you, I can't see you saying, oh, I'm going to watch a video about war today. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have. But, I mean, for you and for this this podcast, oh, but the Sacrifice truth, for the yeah, team. Exactly. I think the thing that I did like is how, again, we've talked about this a million times, how he used art as a way to, like, stand his ground. And he calls right. it, like, using art as a weapon of attack to prove a point. And um, he left there, right? He left or he Spain. left Spain and, and said he wasn't going to return because of that situation. And then, Well, because he, he disagreed with the person... Uh, Francisco Franco yep. and his political views and what he was doing and how he was um, using the socialist perspective to basically destroy his home. So did he create Guernica before he left or after he left? After he, he painted it in Paris. Okay. So okay. The, the painting was actually done in Paris. Uh, he read about this event in the newspaper and it's huge. It's uh, absolutely... I went to the Renia Sofia Art Gallery in Spain and saw it. And it's absolutely... I mean, it's so huge. And, you know, when you look at it, like on a, in a, on a presentation yeah. or a video or something like that, you know, it's it never does it justice. You can never see all those little details and all the stuff that's going on. The little drips and the things that are on the canvas that you just don't pick up on unless you're right in front of it. And you're looking at it. I mean, that's why I feel like international travel and going into the museums and the galleries and seeing this work firsthand, there's really nothing like it. Um, well, and it started in yeah. New York and then moved to Madrid. Well, it kind of went on a tour because yeah. <laughs> because um, Franco, if, I'm, if my memory serves me, Franco said that he wanted it because it went on 
display first in Paris for the World's Fair. And then Franco said, you owe Spain back taxes, mm -hmm. so give us the painting. And Picasso was like, piss off, yeah. fella. And so he took the painting and he sent it to the United States. And then it bounced around different galleries in the United States and then Europe and did kind of a whole tour until finally it was able to uh, to go up at the uh, to go up in Spain. So like a work this big and I know we've talked a little bit about this but like is that normal for it to, for it to be passed around that much? No. So it doesn't happen very often. Not like that. Um, like there are there are definitely paintings that move around. Um, anytime you go to a gallery or a museum or whatever, they're going to have things that are borrowed right, and for different exhibitions, right? And, and then you'll have things where, um, like they'll have a retrospective on an artist, or they'll be talking about a certain time frame, or they'll you know kind of have a collection of different artists. Uh, pieces from different places and then you know they kind of put put things together and um, so sometimes they're loaned out or brought in or whatever uh, but it's very rare for a piece that big to be moved around that much uh, it's just not practical it's just such a huge painting uh, it's not like a you know it's not like you can just box it up in a crate uh, and put it in the back of a truck, even. I yeah, mean, it's huge. I'll, I'll never forget the first time I realized how big the elevators were that were in the art museums yeah. that allowed you to move things from floor to floor with yeah. the different art pieces. That yeah. was that was pretty fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Um, but but ones of original are more um, like smaller sizes, so it's like the size of a. I don't know, a right. wall or a door or something like that. Those can be, get passed around. Even even like very popular ones, like very like millions of dollars worth, or are those more likely to just to stay where they're it, at? It depends on the piece. It depend, there, There's a lot of variables, but I would say that like, for example, there was a, uh, there was a show in Chicago on Vincent Van Gogh that I went to. And uh, so anyway, I was in Chicago and went to, uh, the, you know, they dyed the river green for St. Patrick's Day, go to the art museum, and uh, they had a big show on uh, Vincent Van Gogh. And uh, they had a lot of his works brought in from New York and other Detroit and other places. They were all brought into this show. So you got to see these works all together. And it was the first time in so many years that all three of his bedroom paintings were at the same place at the same time. And again, you've got different collections and different things. Well, they're not just doing that for, for fun or for free. You know, this is a traveling exhibition. It might hit several of these museums where they're big donors and have the... They're offering into the uh, exhibition quite a bit of work. It also could be, you know, well, we'll let you borrow this if you let us borrow that um, sort of a thing. Like for example, one time I went to the Walker in, uh, in Minneapolis, and they had a, a huge um, group of works that was, on, that was on tour from the Louvre in Paris. Oh, wow. So there was a huge display of works from the Louvre that was that was at the Walker. So those kinds of things happen although you got to, you know, yeah. jump on them while they're there cuz it may not ever happen again. Right. You just never know. What are the top 3 in the US art museums? Uh I mean that's hard to say. I mean that's uh, that's I think a lot of people would have a lot of different opinions of okay. what the best or greatest art museums in the United States are. Um, I don't I don't know that I want to dip my toe into That's that fine. murky I just, water. I just wondered but, if there... But there are, I mean, there are a lot of good ones in New York. There are a lot of good ones. Again, East Coast, West Coast, LA, Chicago. You look at your major metropolitan areas, 
most cities have a art museum of some sort or fashion, and I think yeah. they all have something that's worthwhile. I mean, even like a small town, Iowa, big city, Chicago, you know, go to, to Dallas, Texas, you go to wherever, you're going to see, you're going to find the art museum and there's going to be something worth looking at. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. well, I've got one other thing, if you don't mind. Wonderful. So we're going to end with this one. We're going to go back to a, uh, a little bit of a uh, segment that we've had in the past. We're going to go back to it one more time. Like the last time, or like yeah. this is the last time, or are you? No, just... we're just coming back to it again. Okay. This time, this is a segment that we call "Ask the Pod Boss." Got it. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. So this is a actual uh, question from an actual human being that's been that's asked somebody for advice. I'm copying and pasting it. Into your crafting brain. It. I'm crafting it into your brain. <laughs> okay, are you ready? I'm ready? I have a terrible problem on my hands and desperately need your help. Several years ago, after after enduring a nightmare marriage for 27 years, I left my husband Joe with the loving support of a dear friend. We'll call her Sally. Okay. I found a kindred spirit in this funny, gentle, intelligent woman, and without her, I don't know, I would have survived this time in my life, and we virtually were inseparable. I had my own room at her home, and she had her own room in mine. We took trips, spent weekends, holidays together, we took care of each other, and even took care of each other's kids, and I must admit that I've never been happier. But after three years of trying to make it without my husband or a husband, I caved and remarried Joe. That is not where I was expecting that story to go. (laughs) Remarried Joe. He promised to change, and he has been quite tolerable, which is a good way to describe your significant other. The problem I have faced is that I no longer have a place in my life for Sally. I don't have any time for her. She does not fit with my married friends, and she's a single mom, and even though I love her dearly, she's quite eccentric, and my husband does not approve of her. I know how to break up with a man. My question is, how do I break up with a woman? I really thought she'd understand, but apparently she doesn't. She's upset with how things have turned out, and there's nothing that I can do about it. Trying to move forward. You give me these things, and they're so, like, the answer is right in what she said. She said exactly how she felt. There's no longer a place. She's back with her husband. She seems to be somewhat happy. And her husband isn't comfortable with that. And she seems a little bit too eccentric and doesn't fit in. I mean, you tell her that, which it sounds like she already has. And then you move on. So if you're clinging to that for some reason, there's a reason. So what would be the reason? What, what do you think? Because she doesn't want to let go of it. Right. So she's using, like, she's saying she wants to move on. But if she does, all she would have to do is... Hey, what's the lady's name? Sally? Sally. Hey, Sally. You know, I'm back with my husband. I'm very happy. I truly appreciated the time I have with you. I'm so grateful. But at this point, I just have to set some boundaries in order for the relationship for my husband and I to work. And that's what I'm going to do. So I love you. I'm grateful for you. But we're going to have to cut ties. And and if she doesn't, that's because she still wants to not cut ties. Right. Right. That's on her. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> it's very cut and dry, I think. It, well, there you go. In my world, I don't know, but we've had many discussions around this. It's hard to do that. Sometimes And it I is. think it's different if it's your family, where Sally isn't necessarily your family. She sounds very 
close to being her family, but I think it's different with. Well, I think family can be biological and blood, and but but it doesn't have to be. Your your family can be lots of things. It doesn't have to necessarily be. Well, all I'm saying is, she's acting like she has no control over the situation, and she one hundred percent does. You tell her how you feel. You set the boundary and you move on if that's if that's what you want. But if she's struggling with it, she's not going to let go of it, which just sounds sounds like she maybe needs that little bit of security of the backup in case her husband becomes intolerable, intolerable, in, intolerable. Either or, because tolerable to me is a hard word. I'm not going to get back with my ex if he's just tolerable. Me neither. <laughs> that's not. Screw him. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, please hit like, share, subscribe if that calls to you. Uh, we really appreci appreciate you being here and taking the time to listen and respond to comments below. Sounds like we had some, uh, not controversial, but... Good, good discussion. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that was fun. I loved that. Good good or bad. I mean, it it, it, it it makes the conversation move forward. It adds a little something different. Yeah. This is a little bit longer episode than what we normally do, but that's fine. Yeah. Um, well, we took we, a couple we, you know, we, sessions off. We, so. Yeah. We, we've been, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for watching, sharing, subscribing. We'll see you next time.